discussing the news and making sense of a nation on the go. You're listening to The Long Form with Sunny Nayombia. This podcast is brought to you by The New Times. Hello, everyone. On Tuesday, the Rwanda Development Board announced to a room full of investors that the country was looking to attract at least 19 billion francs in marijuana investments, citing the fact that the global marijuana industry was projected to grow from over $28 billion today to just under $200 billion by 2028, our investment body called the growing and processing of marijuana, and I quote, a significant opportunity that could be further explored by Rwanda. In fact, partaking in the marijuana business was ranked among the country's top 100 investment opportunities during the Invest Rwanda Forum held last week. This week, we shall discuss this push to drive investment in this plant and how it relates to issues of criminal justice. We will also spend a bit of time on a particular challenge besetting domestic football, and then we shall conclude this week's podcast answering the question on how exactly we should punish the crime of child rape. To discuss these topics, I will be joined once again by our very own Precious Kirezi. Now, if you want to react to this conversation, use the hashtag longformrw on Twitter and share your thoughts. But before we continue, do you know what you need to do today? You need to join the over 40,000 daily subscribers of the New Times e-paper to enjoy credible, in-depth reporting on Rwanda. Visit the website newtimes.co.rw to register for free. And now, back to the show. Greetings, Precious. Thank you so much for joining me this week. Now, I'd like to discuss our drive to join the global marijuana business. So, what do we know so far? Thanks for having me, Sunny. Potentially, Randa is looking to produce medical cannabis, industrial hemp, edible products, as well as cannabis oils. Two years ago, Randa laid out plans for the growing and exporting of cannabis and its products. This plan improvised a framework responsible for secure cultivation, processing, distribution, and use of cannabis in the country. Last year, Randa made the announcement that 134 hectares had been designated for cannabis production. Speaking earlier to the media, RDB's CEO promised cannabis produced in Rwanda would be exclusively for export purposes and that none would be available for locals. Explaining its economic potential, she pointed out that a hectare of the crop can bring in up to $10 million, a much higher price than the $300,000 that can come out of a hectare of flowers. Currently, the consumption of cannabis products for recreational purposes remains illegal in Rwanda and carries a sentence of three to five years in jail. Sunny, what are your thoughts on the move to join the global marijuana business? Um, thank you so much for that question. To be honest, I'm quite excited about us doing that. We'd be one of the few African countries, um, I think there would be Lesotho, if I'm not mistaken, as well as uh, countries like, uh, I think, South Africa as well, Swaziland, as well as Morocco. Where there are not that, that many African countries that are going into the cannabis business. I think it's because of uh, our own cultures, our very strong uh, religious bodies, you know, the Christians would be up in arms, the Muslims would be up in arms. Oh my God, we're trying to uh, poison uh, people with this devilish plant. So the idea that Rwanda could actually look at this uh, plant, like it being any other plant, like tobacco or uh, macadamia, or any, it's, a, it's a plant like any other, right? So the idea that we could look at this plant in a very sober way, uh, excuse my pun, and think, okay, we have an opportunity here to better the lives of people, to bring in real uh, money into the economy, I think was quite a smart move on uh, the part of the government of Rwanda and RDB. And in fact, I am kind of excited to see if and when uh, this investment will start actually reaping benefits for the economy because, you know, as Claire said, the, the CEO of RDB, one hectare, $10 million, that's amazing. Um, especially with a country like ours, which is quite small. 
in terms of uh, arable land. If we can bring as much income from our limited space, that would be amazing for the economy and also for our exports. And what about those who complain that we're exporting what we don't allow Rwandans to consume freely? Someone could say that that's the hypocrisy of the situation, that um, on one side we have no problem sending out marijuana products. Not that we're doing it right now, but the idea is to do that, uh, to send it out as edibles, as gummies, as maybe uh, CBD oils, marijuana oils. Uh, they're called CBD or THC oils. And, and thinking that's okay for us to send this medical marijuana and all these edibles out there. While at the same time, uh, we are sentencing Rwandans right, left, and center for uh, merely consuming. I'm not talking about the trafficking. I'm not, because that's a totally different conversation. I mean, I looked at some of the numbers. Um, over the last three years, 12,341 people were prosecuted for the mere consumption of marijuana. I'm not talking about trafficking. I'm not talking about, you know, these are. this is not Pablo Escobar we're talking about. This is someone who was maybe uh, caught smoking one spliff or did something and added it to their tea. And I find that cruel, especially the fact that they're not harming anyone. Um, I find that quite cruel. In these issues of drug uh, law enforcement. There's been a move to move away from criminalization into, you know, what we could call the decriminalization um, versus legalization, right? So there are two, two different concepts that I think we need to look at. Maybe decriminalization, legalization might be a road too far for us as a society and say, you know what, this substance is actually legal which would be what legalization would be. So it becomes like something as like say when we use tobacco or alcohol. But if we could perhaps go into decriminalization, then it would allow for a situation, for example, where in Rwanda right now, prostitution is not legal. But prostitutes, sex workers, are not being prosecuted anymore. They're not going to jail for prostitution anymore. Very often now, uh, it is maybe what they call the Johns or the people who are looking for the services who are in fact being chased by law enforcement. In countries like a few countries, the United States, uh, Canada has now totally gone into uh, legalization. I mean, even the Netherlands. The Netherlands hasn't uh, legalized it, but they've decriminalized it. So you can take a certain small amount for personal use. And because you're not trafficking, you're not trying to make money off of it. The state, instead of uh, maybe sending you to one year of jail time or two years or three years or up to five years, they will simply make you pay a fine because now it's no longer a criminal issue. It's maybe a civil issue. So you'll maybe pay a fine or there is going to be mandatory drug rehabilitation that you have to go through. Um, so it's no longer a, a way of punishing people. It becomes a way to like maybe one, just leave them alone or um, help them work it out. Right. So funny enough, that's actually what we're doing in Iwawa. Right. So people who have uh, young, young men, very often it's young men who are having drug problems. Very often they're being sent there and, and getting some treatment. But we still see cases where uh, people actually do go to jail for years uh, because of being found smoking or ingesting uh, cannabis. The way I see it right now with, with a question that you asked me is I think right now uh, the way we are criminalizing it, uh, the consumption, is I don't think it works best for the country that we are. It, it hurts young people. It also hurts the state. I mean, at the end of the day, you as a state or as a taxpayer, you have to uh, clothe, house, and feed someone who could have been uh, housing themselves, clothing themselves, feeding themselves for up to five years because they were smoking, I'm sorry, I have to say, it, they were smoking a dried plant. I think that we need to do better and maybe come up with something that works a bit better because we're literally saying that this plant is not the devil's plant. 
right? Because if it was, say, the cocoa plant, which creates cocaine, that is something that, you know, there's a hard line in the sand. We don't do that. We cannot justify the fact that we can make money by planting this plant because we understand that there's no good to it versus, say, cannabis, where we are now saying that it's good enough to make us money. But you young people or even older people, let's also be very honest. It's not just young people who are in, uh, using it. You will go to jail because you're consuming this very product that we're making millions off of. I think there needs to be a further discussion. I think that we need to get on the decriminalization train as fast as possible. And so those are kind of my thoughts. Do you think the double standards are ever going to end? You also mentioned how if no one was making money off of it, it would kind of be like socially acceptable or okay. But in what situation does no one make money off of it? Because even the small quantity that you get, say, to for medical purposes or you bought from someone else. Again, that's a supply and demand problem, right? So I'm saying... National police go after the suppliers, right? And leave the consumers alone, okay? Because truthfully, this is the fact. If there was no way that people could buy it, there would be no consumers. It's as simple as that. That's just kind of my thinking. I'm quite liberal when it comes to it. Hopefully, uh, with us taking this very first step to go into the business of marijuana, I'm hopeful that a few years from now, uh, a larger conversation will be held by society and we'll start asking ourselves, okay, these 12,000 people, do we really need to be prosecuting them? I think not. Before we continue this very interesting conversation, are you looking for a job or is there a tender you want to bid for? On the New Times Job Mart, you will find hundreds of jobs and tender listings. Visit the Job Mart today by going to its website, jobs.newtimes.co.rw. If you want to post a job opportunity, call 7 85 and ask about the great rates. And now back to the show. Also happening this week, Salma Mukansanga, the first African woman to officiate in the Men's World Cup, received the Forbes Women's Sports Award. Now, despite being internationally recognized and breaking countless glass ceilings, she still has to deal with the darker side of the world's favorite game. While refereeing a local football game in January, she was verbally attacked by fans, some calling her a prostitute. Personally, I find this deplorable, but Sunny, what issues do these two contrasting stories bring out for you? As everyone who knows me quite well, they know that I love football. And on the other side, I'm also quite interested in issues of gender and feminism and women's rights. So these two contrasting stories were kind of like brought to me the bright side of football which is it gives opportunities to people to really shine. But the dark side of football as well is that football is just a small microcosm of society. Football is not immune to the darker sides of society. Now, what Salma went through was what women in power or women go through in, very often in the workspace, which is harassment which is mistreatment and being made to feel comfortable, especially when they are in a space that has not been traditionally theirs to be a part of. I'm pretty sure that this kind of name calling wouldn't have happened if she was refereeing, say, a woman's game. Fans would have felt that this ref is a legitimate participant in what, what we're watching. But the idea that she participated in a men's game in the running football league and she's a woman it kind of made it uh, somewhat shocking i guess and then the darker uh, sides of our society kind of started uh, revealing themselves because i'm pretty sure that outside football they probably tweeted her her nomination for uh, the world cup they were excited to see uh, her represent us but when the rubber hit the road then they went back into their familiar tropes of let us see how to hurt this woman. And of course, in this sexist world, what's the worst thing that you can tell a woman? 
that she is sexually immoral. And that's what they did. I'm happy that the government and the public prosecution uh, decided to go after these fans. I'm also happy that Ferwafa acted quite hard uh, against these fans. That is a good thing. But the fact of the matter is this. Sports is just like society. Whenever you have marginalized groups moving into a new area, there is often pushback by the power structures. In this case, it was misogyny, but sometimes, as in the case of Serena Williams, uh, the black uh, African-American world number one who was number one for years on end, she had to deal with racism. Right. As a black woman coming into a traditionally white sport or uh, right now, uh, there's a big uh, there are big discussions on what's happening in Real Madrid with uh, Brazilian superstar Vinicius Jr., who is being I, I can only call it attacked by fans whenever he goes to other stadiums they're calling him a monkey there there have been cases of black players being pelted with bananas and you know being called the n-word and being made to feel very very uh, uncomfortable and this is something that we've seen in sport and unfortunately sport like i said earlier is a reflection of larger society so when i saw her triumph in forbes i felt so happy for her because the previous couple of weeks it had just been um i'm sure she felt quite saddened by the way she was uh, treated she was treated absolutely it was not good and i did not see enough online support and pushback against these fans and I wish I'd seen a lot more. I did not see as much reporting about it as I should have. But I'm happy that uh, her latest triumph allowed us to also continue celebrating her because she's an amazing representation of Rwandan womanhood and Rwandans as, as a whole. There are not many like her. I love that she's putting Randall on the map for the right reasons. Yeah, no, absolutely. She's, she's been amazing. So now that we're coming close to the end of this this week's podcast, what is the last story we're going to talk about? On Tuesday, Antoine Gouvevana, the former permanent secretary in the Ministry of Disaster Management and Refugee Affairs, received a 10-year jail sentence for child rape. It was proved that he had raped a child for over eight years, starting when the girl was six years of age up until she was 14. Despite the prosecution's request for a maximum sentence of 25 years, the presiding judge at Casabo Intermediate Court decided to give him a lesser sentence of 10 years in prison due to the fact that he had not been convicted of any crimes prior to this. Do you think this was a fair judgment? Hmm. Oh my goodness. Um, as a father to a child, the idea that a grown man would molest my child it's every parent's worst nightmare before i even talk about this my heart goes out to the girl and her loved ones because this was an absolute disaster so with that out of the way so law is a funny thing i think it was a couple of podcasts ago i was talking about how we need to move away sometimes from harsh punishments, and really uh, utilizing non-custodial sentences. But in this case, where you have a man in positions of power, right? This is not just uh, a man off the street. This is someone that the society should have looked up to, a permanent secretary in a ministry to come and rape a child. Very often they like to call it defilement, but sometimes I think that word is not strong enough. We have to call it what it is. He raped a child of six for eight years. Her life is destroyed. She'll never be the same again, right? Parents' life is destroyed. Her community's life is destroyed. I mean, this man has destroyed so many lives. And the idea that this judge looked at the law and interpreted that mitigating circumstance, he gave him a lesser sentence because it was the first incident. But here's the thing. It was not just a single incident. It was a continuous bunch of crimes. It wasn't. It was eight years. All my legal training tells me that, you know, I really shouldn't say much because, you know, uh, one, we want to respect our judges and we want to give them the, their due consideration. 
But in this case, it's hard for me. The fact that he wasn't convicted prior, I think that maybe we need to look at criminal procedure articles and ask ourselves, maybe, just maybe, there should be crimes where certain mitigating circumstances are not allowed. In this case, child defilement, child rape, no, 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 no. I have never done anything before. It's not a big self or you did something that you in lives for such a long time. No, it's, it's absolutely crazy. And right now, I'm really hoping that Parliament is looking at the penal law when it comes to this very issue of child defilement and thinking and asking themselves, okay, are there some crimes, are there some violations that there should be maximum mandatory sentences? I'm not a fan of maximum mandatory sentences. When they talk about maximum mandatory, it just means that if you are convicted of a certain kind of crime, you can only get the maximum. They cannot find a way to to give you a lesser sentence. I think that our justice sector, the Ministry of Justice and and our MPs need to really think this one through. This story just left me with a terrible taste in my mouth. Unfortunately, that is how we ended. I wish I was able to end this week with a better story, but that is how it is. Before I sign off, and on a better note, here are two of some of the bigger stories that were published by the New Times this week. Rwanda has been ranked 7th in Africa in terms of global soft power. This news was revealed on Monday in the 2023 Global Soft Power Index. This report, released by Brand Finance, measured the appeal of a country's soft power assets, including its cultural heritage, education, governance, and global reputation. In contrast to hard power, soft power is the ability to co-opt rather than to coerce. The currency of soft power includes culture, political values, and foreign policies. Egypt, South Africa, Morocco, Mauritius, Seychelles, Tunisia, Rwanda, Algeria, Ivory Coast, and Ghana, respectively, were the top 10 African countries. The 73rd FIFA Congress will commence today in Kigali. The four-day Congress will be the second ever held in Sub-Saharan Africa since the one hosted by South Africa in 2010. During this Congress, FIFA presidential elections will be held at the BK Arena and standing unopposed, FIFA President Gianni Infantino is expected to win a four-year term. Before we leave, would you like to partner with The Long Form? Send an email to sales at newtimesronda.com and ask for our rates. If you enjoy this show, subscribe to The Long Form with Sunny Nayombia on your favorite podcast service. You can find us on Spotify, Apple, and Amazon Music, as well as the New Times website. Until next week, goodbye.